Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Leading Blind. I know I'm running late this month, but today we're going to discuss in honor of the month of Thanksgiving, Scent of a Woman. Directed by Martin Bread, this movie stars Al Pacino, Chris O'Donnell, Philip Seymour Hoffman, James Redbourne, and Gabriel Anwar. The story is about Charlie Sims, a prep school student in New England who is attending this prestigious um, boarding school on a scholarship rather than being one of the many wealthy students who's fortunate enough to attend there. In order to afford a plane ticket home for Christmas, he takes a temporary Thanksgiving job attending to the retired Colonel Lieutenant Frank Slade, who is a blind alcoholic while the rest of his family is visiting other relatives. Before he begins his Thanksgiving weekend with Frank, however, Charlie and a fellow student played by Philip Seymour Hoffman witness three fellow students setting up a prank to humiliate the headmaster of their school, Mr. Trask. And after this prank is played out, the headmaster very quickly finds out who two witnesses were due to another teacher having seen the witnesses there the night before and can only assume they witnessed the prank being set up. The headmaster talks to both boys together, and then sends the wealthy Mr. Hoffman's character, um, Willis, out of the room, and then basically bribes Charlie, or blackmails Charlie, would probably be a better way of putting it. He says that if he gives up who the people that set this prank up are, he will basically guarantee he's accepted to Harvard. And if he doesn't, well, he just might get kicked off the scholarship program. Uh, Charlie is clearly conflicted by this, but he decides to remain silent at the moment, say nothing, and there is going to be basically a trial after the, the Thanksgiving Day weekend. His friend Willis tells him not to worry about it. They have their story. They're not going to Welsh on their friends. And he'll see him after the holiday weekend. So now Charlie has this on his shoulders during the holiday weekend when he has to go deal with the blind drunk Lieutenant Colonel Frank Slade, played by Al Pacino. And much to his surprise, as soon as that family that's left him with this man has abandoned ship for the weekend, Frank decides they're going to do the same thing. He tells Charlie, hey, my flight leaves, and he whisks Charlie off to New York City to stay in the famous Waldorf Astoria Hotel and eat in the famous Oak Room Dining Hall. Charlie barely knows how to react to any of this or keep up with this man who's crass, cantankerous, rude. I mean, he's just Al Pacino. What do you expect? <laughs> And over the course of their dinner at the Oak Room, Frank admits that his goal over this weekend in New York is basically to enjoy himself, to uh, indulge in luxuries. And then at the end of the weekend, he intends to commit suicide by blowing his brains out, which uh, definitely is not what Charlie needed to hear when he's just been trying to get home ever since realizing he was being dragged to New York City because this wasn't part of the deal. But he also feels really guilty at the very thought of leaving a handicapped man alone in New York City, especially one that tends to blow his brains out. But um, Frank says, look, I've cashed all my disability checks. I'm going to enjoy myself. This is what I want to do, and I really need your help to do it. So Charlie thinks, well, maybe if I do everything he says, maybe I can take this time to talk him out of it. While also dealing with his own issues that are going on at school at the same time. Dealing with phone calls to Willis in the Alps on a ski trip for Thanksgiving. 
who is very slowly changing his story about, well, I, I don't know about the keeping quiet thing and I'm going to take care of you to, well, my dad says this and I think I'm going to have to do that and shows that he's basically just in daddy's pocket, a point that Al Pacino brings up way later in the movie. So, through the course of their weekend, they make an uninvited trip to White Plains in order to visit Frank's brother, and they have a very, very awkward Thanksgiving Day dinner with the family, and that is how Charlie finds out that the way that Frank lost his eyesight was by basically getting drunk and juggling grenades, and making the mistake of pulling the pin out of one of them. Yeah, not quite a war hero. But it's really devastating how much disdain you see this man has for his brother. And you get the impression throughout the movie that you can completely understand if people don't like Frank's character. But the proportion that it's taken to makes you kind of suspect it could be their fault, at least in part, that he is such an asshole to begin with. On their ride back from White Plains, Charlie tells Frank about what's going on at school. He recommends that Charlie cash in before his friend does because there's no way somebody that can buy their way into that school is going to risk their own future because they can afford to pay to keep him in school even if he's done something wrong. Charlie can't risk that and he needs to sell out before his friend. They go to a restaurant in New York, have another nice meal, and there Charlie takes notice of a woman sitting alone, Donna. Frank, of course, being this insatiable man whore, basically, throughout the whole movie, hiring highly paid escorts and talking about the scent of a woman and what a woman can do for a man and all that crass, crude stuff walks them over to see if he can't set Donna up a little bit with Charlie and play games. But it turns out she has somebody with her, her husband, but she's just waiting for him to arrive. And Frank talks her into dancing on the dance floor there in this elegant restaurant. And she says, I don't know how. And he says, I can teach you. And they dance this fabulous tango. You've got to see this movie for this scene alone. You can find the scene by itself on YouTube if you don't care about the overacting Pacino that won him an Oscar. The following morning, Frank seems very despondent. He's assembling and reassembling his gun, and he obviously is at the point where he's done. He doesn't want to even keep going anymore, but Charlie talks him down and suggests they go for a drive. And this leads them to a Ferrari dealership where the lieutenant has put away his cane, is acting as if he can see... And they go for a wild ride. That's, that's all I can say. They go for a wild ride. <laughs> After the Ferrari ride, Frank really does actually get ready to blow his brains out this time. And there is a major scuffle for the gun. But Charlie doesn't back down and he fights him. And I mean, he grapples for that gun. And in the end, he's able to talk Frank down. And the lieutenant reluctantly agrees to return home with Charlie. After the holiday weekend, it is time for the inquiry on the prank that was played on the headmaster's car. And it's set up like a full-blown trial. The students of Baird are there, and there's the assembly and the school board. And there's Philip Seymour Hoffman's character, Willis, with his father and a high-paid lawyer, and there is Charlie, who he is very, very surprised to find himself joined by Lieutenant Slade. And Willis tries to pussyfoot around the matter when he's asked about what he witnessed the night the prank was set up. And although he does give names, he's like, I, I can't be sure, but it seemed like these three people, I don't have good eyes. And then Charlie just refuses to say anything. And because he refuses to give up any information at all, Trask, the headmaster, actually recommends that he be expelled from the school. 
Well, Slade can't take this. He launches himself into this passionate defense speech on Charlie's behalf about the uh, suspicious integrity of a school that will reward a snitch and punish a boy that actually has enough integrity to defend his classmates. I mean, he's not, he didn't do anything wrong. He saw it. He's just not a snitch. And he tells the school that if they punish Charlie for being a good human being and what they want to do is beat that out of him and kill his spirit by sending him home packing, then they have failed. And this is like, Al Pacino has a lot of good speeches and monologues and movies, but I think this is his personal best. I don't care about the overacting. I don't care about any of that stuff. This is his best speech to date that I have heard, and I've seen quite a few of his speeches in films. And probably because of his speech, the disciplinary committee decide that they're going to put the three identified students on probation, basically say nothing at all about Willis's part in identifying them. In other words, yeah, we know you did this, but we're not going to say good for you for snitching, and we're not going to punish you for snitching. And then they just decide, Charlie can just go about his way. He's not punished in any way. And we really, really are proud of you, basically. <laughs> so basically, because of Frank Slade, and because of Charlie saving Frank Slade's life, Charlie gets to continue going to the Bayard School and will hopefully have a very fruitful life. And that's basically it. It's not really a, it's not a deep drama, but there's a lot that actually gets talked about in this movie without too many things being said. Uh, Frank is treated very well in spite of his disability, except by his family. And you get the idea that his family, A, hates his drinking, and B, is disgusted by how he became disabled. And... Charlie, although put up with by a lot of the students at Baird, and a couple of them consider him kind of friends, he's never invited to their chalets in Switzerland or anything like that. It's just he's left there at the school by himself because his daddy can't afford to bring him home for the holidays. You know, he's on his own. He has to find a way to pay for his own ticket home for Christmas. And, you know, you can you get the idea that they respect him just for getting the scholarship, but he's not on their level and they don't see him that way. And the school clearly doesn't see him that way. They think the only way he can be of worth is to become one of them through harder work than they will ever have to suffer through. And the fact that he is rewarded for his soul and his integrity by somebody who doesn't seem to have a whole heck of a lot of it himself I mean, it is amazing. Uh, part of Pacino's speech has to do with um, the fact that he has seen men torn apart by war, but there's nothing worse than a broken soul, and he won't let the school do that to Charlie by kicking him out. And it's really touching that just these two guys of different generations can affect each other, you know, kind of in a small way, but so enormously at the same time in the end. They show each other the proper respect and they get positive outcomes because of it. And I love movies that show you that. Charlie just had enough compassion to refuse to name names and to tell Slade, hey, why not? Why don't you just not do this? You know, I don't remember if in the movie he tells him what he's got to live for. But I do think he basically just says, you don't have to do this. That's all he really says. You don't have to do this. You don't want to do this. And in the end, he's proven right. Because in the end, that's what Frank does. He goes home to his niece's house. 